Hello and welcome to Journey to a Dream brought to you by Kawasaki Insurance. Now, our podcasts are not just for people on two wheels. Today, we're talking to somebody who normally rides around the course on three. And interestingly, we also get to hear life from his partner's point of view as well. Let's meet them. So I'm Jake Roberts. And I'm Abby Taylor. I'm a sidecar passenger. Um, I'm 19. Started when I was about 16. Um, well, as soon as I could really. But yeah, I grew up around it, so it's all I wanted to do. Me dad used to do it. We, we don't really speak now, but yeah, he used to do it. So all my memories, earliest memories are from being up in the paddock and racing and stuff. And growing up, like, so Ryan and Callum and stuff, running around together. And then all of a sudden you're racing together. It's a bit, it's a bit mental. Obviously, they're a bit quicker, like, but yeah, it's just... I, I, when you grow up to do it and like around it it's literally all you want to do you like spend like going to bed every night just like i can't wait to do the tt and then you finally do it (laughs) and from making that decision to actually making it happen how's that process been fast very fast um i got my novice license when i was uh in the may of being 16 so that would have been what am i yeah two years ago uh just after covid and within six months of actually racing i had my national license so then all i had to do was get enough signatures to the tt so it was literally like i think back to back for like nine or ten weeks we were just away every weekend like just trying to get to it being a sidecar passenger i mean i don't know whether you'd be able to put into words what that experience is like because watching from the sidelines it looks terrifying. It's it's not that bad, to be honest. And everyone says, oh, yeah, that's crazy. That's just because you do it. But it's it's actually not that bad. It's, it's I don't know, it's such a weird feeling. You don't get it doing, like, anything else. Like, I just like going fast in general, like, doing anything sort of dangerous or exciting, all sorts of bike racing, anything. But, yeah, when you're, when you're on there, I think it makes a difference when there's two of you on it and you're just so in tune and it's... It's just such a weird feeling. It's ace. It's just such a buzz. But what is it like literally not having any direct control because you are literally in the hands yeah. of your driver? Well, it's you do really. So, like, short circuit racing, you get it a lot more because, like, if we, we go around a, a corner and I'm not doing exactly what I should do. The bike will sort of let you know you're not doing your job. So it's short circuit racing. And sometimes when the boys are pushing on roads, you'll see it as well, but they'll, they'll, like, snatch from side to side and that's it's just, like, struggling for grip and stuff like that And when you're really on it. But... Yeah, the, he, Jack O, my driver, he'll know when I'm not where I should be, and I do as well. So, You're not a, a sidecar passenger? <laughs> no, I'm just the supportive partner. <laughs> what is it like from your point of view? Because, like I say, watching it when you've got no direct connection with somebody is one thing, but when, you know, it's somebody that you love going around there, that must be quite terrifying sometimes. It's hard because... That it's all he's ever dreamed of. He loves it, and it, he comes off, and he's buzzing. But it's so scary. Like you're just on edge constantly until they ride back into the paddock. That's when you can breathe. Then it feels like you don't breathe for like an hour. And just listening to Jake talking about it, it does seem that to do what he wants to do, you have to live and breathe it. Yeah, definitely. You've got to soak it all up. You've just got to work your backside off to get wherever you want to be. Jake, just talk us through what the preparations for the TT were like then, because I think, again, people see you on the start line and don't necessarily think about what's gone into making that happen. Yeah, so a lot of money, first of all, <laughs> like a lot of money. I mean, to we've got a long wheelbase sprinter van that we've, we've, we've got converted into a camper van and just to put that on the boat alone with a bit of a cheaper rate, it's like £400 and then you put 100 quid of diesel in it or something like that to come and get your signatures and then you've got your race entries which are like 300 quid and a set of tires on a sidecar are a thousand pounds and you need you need that every meeting if you want to be competitive so it's a, in and around 1500 pounds every single time you leave the island to go racing and Derby's great but there's there's not enough of it and that we struggle for entries and stuff like that so to the way the signatures work and stuff you've got to you've got to be active enough you've got to do so many races and it's a bit of a hindrance living over here but it You've just got to make the extra effort to, to do it. The, the boys over there, they can they can drive a couple of hours and we always find it quite funny, don't we? We'll, we'll get to meetings like with time off work and towards the end of the year, you're trying to stretch all your holidays and we're leaving on the six o'clock ferry, getting in at midnight, driving to Cadwell Park four for hours, three hours. So getting you're there. there at half four in the morning. Yeah, and then you wake up in the morning and someone goes, oh, I, oh, I drove all the way from up north, I'm knackered. And it's like you, you've had an absolute journey to get there. but you, And then getting the red eye boat back, getting in at six o'clock and going straight to work. But 
yeah, it's worth it when you've you get to it. have done that plenty of times. <laughs> Is this what you signed up for? Well, I've got no choice, really. <laughs> in terms of the money then, what is the process in terms of getting sponsorship and getting the money financially that you need, like? Well, sidecars, it's a, it's a bit... Everyone, it's it's really tight-knit. I mean, you'll know that from going around interviewing people. Everyone knows everyone in, the, in racing in general, but sidecars, is, it's literally just like one big family, so... And it's quite niche, like not many people know about it. Everyone, like, there's always asking questions, but it's sort of just hoot through meeting people and getting to know people. I mean, Davey, the AV Cranes, he's he's been a massive help. He literally got us going. He, that's the reason I started. Um, I was living in the in the pub where I was living and he was drinking in there and he sponsored Jacko already and literally took me from literally just drinking with him and spieling rubbish and how I want to go racing. And he was like, well, why don't you come up to Jerby? And then... It, it just slowly starts progressing from there and it's just you need a lot of help from people as well people that look at you and go you really want to do this don't you so yeah we should probably at this point talk a little bit about uh, the driver that you ride with tell us about him yeah so mike jackson his name is he's um he, he probably would have been here if he could but he's he's, he's chocker himself as well that's his business the, the freight hub so yeah he's he's been doing this for a long time now he so callum crow started with him they won the british f2 cup together he's yeah harry payne who's away doing great in the world championships he's sort of known for he, he says himself i seem to make all these these superstars. these superstars and he always seems to stay in the shadows a bit but yeah he's he's unbelievable and like his just his race craft and everything but he had a bit of a crash in 2018 i think it was with sarah stoko and he took an injury to his hand and uh, he lost half of that finger that one got fused straight he lost half of that one and he had a long road to recovery doing that just in himself so it was sort of a good match when I come along because I was just getting to the age of doing it and he's been at the, the front end of like British Championship and stuff, but he was getting back into it, so he was taking it slow as well, so it just it worked quite well, and then we just went from there. And what is that relationship like between you? Because I guess it has to be intuitive almost, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, you, you see us on going around the TT course and, think, and people think, oh, you must be mental to trust each other, but it, it, you don't just go racing on a weekend like you're... You, you're talking throughout the week. You you are like like close friends, best friends. I mean, I I obviously trust them enough to take me around the TT course. But yeah, you've got to find someone that you really gel with before you're even on the bike. Like it's it's a weird sort of thing. You you, you get used to it when you start racing with them. But there's a few people you can you can ride with, and you're like, Whoa, I'm not not getting on that again. Yeah, it's a, some people use you as literally a ballast, and some people are, like Jacko used to be a passenger himself. He's passengered for Carl Bennett and stuff like that. So yeah, he. Yeah, just very understanding as well. And how do you communicate when you're going around that quickly? Uh, you don't really, which, yeah. Some people think we've got, like, intercom, which we don't. Um, Would that be a good idea? <laughs> probably not, because I just sort of, yeah, I just make all sorts of crazy noises. I can noises see him going around, and he's, like, nodding his head. Like, I can see he's singing a song inside his helmet. Yeah, I just, I just enjoy it. Like, I'll be, like, talking to myself. Like, around the TT course, you're, you're talking to yourself constantly. But it's, it's almost... I don't think it would be a good idea. Some people, I think it's been tried, but you're both in your own zone. So he, like sidecar drivers will say, and Jacko tells me this all the time, he says he rides that like he's on a solo bike. It's only when we sort of get back to the grandstand or whatever, he's like, oh, he's still there. So yeah, it, I'm doing my thing and he's doing his, but you're just both on the same bike. And you are really incredibly young to have already achieved what was one of your goals, to, yeah. to race in the TT. At what point did you make that decision that the TT was something you definitely wanted to do that was that was always the plan from so I mean I remember like speaking to Chris Kinley and my mum was like tell me stuff like I'd be dead young and Chris will be like with me in the microphone and like the winners enclosure and stuff and I always said like this is this is what I'm going to do and you it's everyone's got big like dreams and big goals and and then to actually like get to it it's it's just crazy like I still can't believe I've done it now and it was only this year but yeah it's 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 just bonkers <laughs> And in terms of your family's response, because I'm guessing they will have known yeah. from a very early age that this yeah. is what you wanted to do, but what was the general reaction from them? Um, my mum sort of, I think she always just sort of put it to the back of her mind that I wouldn't do it. I mean, I remember when we finished the TT um, and we were all like enjoying a drink and everything, just relaxing a bit. She, she said, I, I knew you were going to do this. She said, I used to put like the carrier, like the kid baby carrier. She said, we used to put that on the platform of the sidecar when my dad was riding with Dave Molyneux. We used to put that on the platform of the sidecar and Dave would be warming the bike up and you'd actually fall asleep. She said, we, we should have known then really, but I think she knew she wasn't going to escape it, but yeah. And in terms of the day job, what is that? I work at Magic Carpets now, so 
I've, I was apprentice mechanic for a bit as well, but I've got a really, really, really good job. All that's on my mind constantly is going racing. I think anyone that goes racing is like that. I mean, people are interested in progressing in their job, and don't get me wrong, I'm in, interested in all that as well. And like, we've just moved into our first house and stuff like that, but like, it's just my head's just constantly racing. Like the winter going into now, it's the worst time of the year. Like. You'll know. You'll you'll say that yourself. She It'll says it'll be miserable for months and months, and then it'll get to my birthday, which is a week before the season starts, <laughs> and then we have a big blowout for my birthday, and then it's back racing for six months, and he's the happiest he can be. Yeah, it's there's just nothing like it. I don't think anywhere. So is he never short of things to get him for Christmas? Well, I know <laughs> he's constantly needing a new back protector, new boots, leathers, helmet. <laughs> the list's endless. <laughs> Just thinking about the work, and I suppose that's what's great about you you living here, growing up here in the Isle of Man, is that people do understand that complete obsession. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I've, people are in England and stuff, they, it must be a bit harder for them. And it's like, oh, I need two weeks off to go over to the Isle of Man and race on public roads. And they're a bit like, what? But over here, it's like, oh, I'm doing the TT. And it's, you get such a great reception from people as well. Like my grandmother, she was watching Ramsey, like, because we're all we're from Ramsey, and she said, like, the noise when you're coming through Parliament Square, it's like, we were in 13th, and it's like, but you just know everyone, and people know you're on, like, Facebook and stuff like that, like, people commenting on stuff like that. It's crazy to see that even though you're not up there, like, just from being everyday Joe and knowing people, they, they support you. And I think there's a real affection, isn't there, for the sidecar community? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, people love it. I think I think people are just a bit gobsmacked by it. And I think, yeah, we are. We must be a bit crazy, but it's normal to us. Yeah, I didn't want to say it. <laughs> um, the reality is, is that however you choose to go around the TT course on closed roads, it is dangerous. And I just wonder how... I, suppose, I don't know, how do you address that in your own mind? Is it something that you ever really think about? Yeah, yeah, and I, I spoke to a few people about this at TT. Um, I think people need to speak about it a bit more, to be honest. I had this, like, just dread the whole time, like, running up to TT, even all through practice week and stuff. You've just got it in the back of your head that, like, something could happen, and it's everyone sort of is thinking the same around you, and, like, the start line's like a crazy, like, the first ever race, like, well, both races as well. It's you almost feel guilty, like you're saying bye to everyone, and like it's just really eerie, and it's just it's not a nice feeling at all. But then, I'm sort of the lucky one because as soon as as soon as we leave the grandstand, that that he's got that tap on the shoulder, everything's gone for me. I'm I'm racing, but these guys have to sit there for an hour and and still feel that same feeling. So that's where yeah, it's everyone's got it in the back of the mind. And last year wasn't a good year for the sidecars. We like we've had friends from the racing community that sadly died over here but it's just it, it never stop any of us doing it I don't think but it's yeah it's always in everyone's minds. And would you be able to maybe put into words what it is like for you standing on that start line certainly for the first time this year? Terrific like you feel like the emotions just take over like you you just can't keep it in. I think I did pretty well at keeping myself together I just I could I was crying but I was crying behind my sunglasses so no one could see. Like you'll see pictures of us all on the start line and I've got a face like thunder. Like honestly you'd think that we'd just had the biggest argument ever. Like I I've got a face like thunder but it's just that dread. And then you're walking along with him and we hold hands as we're walking up because it's um a bit where like where they tap to let's say that you can go that's no man's land no none of your family friends can go in there there's just two bikes in there so you have to say goodbye to them before that but we walk up holding hands while everyone's pushing the bike up jacko's in the bike ready to go and then as soon as he lets go that's when that feeling just gets even worse but i know he's gone then so i can display the emotion i want to because i don't want to show it in front of him because he just feels worse he said to me um when we got back to the van he was like i just feel so guilty i feel horrible and I was like, no, because it is such an amazing feeling for me because you're doing what you love, but it's also just so scary. That's a real responsibility for you to carry, isn't it? Definitely, yeah. Um, uh, to be honest, I do main like most of the entries and everything for them. Like <laughs> Team manager. Well, pretty much. <laughs> they just put everything on to me. They, they just go racing, pretty much. <laughs> I sort everything out and I think they're both that laid back and chilled which is so nice but sometimes I'm so stressy with them I'm like you've got a you've got a meeting in a week like what's going on we haven't even booked a boat <laughs> so I think because I've got the responsibility and I kind of 
plan everything. I know what's going on all the time. So I'm never like, oh God, what's next? Oh God, what's next? Like I've always constantly got it in my head. We're going here. This is what's happening. This is how long we're there for. This is what time practice is. This is what time qualifying is. So I can prepare myself. And when they're out on the road, on the track, what are you doing then? Uh, at TT, I had the live timing on my phone. So I was just constantly refreshing the live time and waiting for them at the next sector. I had such a support network with me. I had Jake's mum. I had my best friend, Keely, and her husband, Callum. I had Natalie, Nathan, our really good friends. I had such a great support network that they were all there with me. And it, it was all lovely. Like, we were there as much as we were all nervous. I wouldn't sit on the grandstand and watch. I couldn't. But as soon as I knew that they were coming, when they got to Cronk Nimona, I would walk back round up through and I'd watch them come through and then I'd walk back to my seat and I'd sit there and I'd refresh the live time and <laughs> until I knew they were coming again. And I think that was just the, my way of coping. Like, after what happened at the Southern last year, I would watch the whole race and I saw the bike in behind them come through and I was like, where are they? What's going on? And this dread just like filled my body and I felt like I could just fall to the floor. And I went running around and I just remember shouting. I was like, where is he? Where is he? And they were like, I don't know, I don't know. No one could tell me where they were. And then my phone rang and it was Jake and he was like, I'm so sorry, I'm, I've, I've come off. And I, it was just, that was all that was all I heard. And he was like, I'm okay, I'm okay. And then he was like, right, I love you, bye. And it was literally like a 30 second phone call. And then, I'm like walking up and down looking for him and someone's like they've just rode back into the paddock so I'm sprinting up back to the paddock and Jack was like I'm so sorry Abby I don't know what's happened and that broke my heart because I was like it's not it's no one's fault what's happened here but no one could tell me where he was none of the officials could tell me anything and I was his next of kin and I, I had no clue and then the marshal phoned me back so it was obviously the phone he called me off so they had my number and he said I'm, I'm sorry love I don't know what's happened he's on the floor and he's bleeding and I was like what I was like what's happened where are you I was like I needed to get to him I was just like I need to know where he is and I need to know what's going on and no one could tell me anything and Jacko was like trying to figure it out he was like I honestly don't know so I went back up and they were like I'm like we're sending an ambulance around looking for him but then they told me he'd walked off it was like so many mixed messages so I think because I, I only did the entry for the Southern last year. So I felt like this year, everything had to be on time, organised, because I needed to know everything was going on, like, at every point. Like, I would never want to go through anything, like, that happened at the Southern again. It was awful. Jake, what do you remember about what happened? Uh, that was, that was believe it or not, the first ever time I'd ever come off, like, a sidecar. We'd never had a crash or anything, so we'd been we'd been pretty flat out for about a year and a half. And uh, you've got to do one road race signature to go to the TT, so... The boys in England obviously preferred Scarborough, or uh, well, other, unless they come over here anyway. But for us, it's it's the Southern Hundred, and TT is always the goal. But road racing is road racing, and the Southern's just another one to tick off the box. But I went into that very, I'd we'd been achieving such great results in short circuit and like British Championship. We were we were running. We we're probably still third in the British Championship at that point. We finished mm-hmm. fifth, um, and like. I think, yeah, being 18 years old and doing your first road race, I had a, definitely a bit of a chip on the shoulder and it's it's completely different. Um, I'm not sure what it's like for the solo boys, but, but the difference between racing on a track and racing on the road, it's just, it's something that I couldn't, I didn't get into my head as much as I, I should have done. The wind, for starters, you don't, you don't really get any wind on short circuits, but like through the trees and stuff and around the someone under the wind was just unbelievable. And I had, arm pump's a big thing for all of us, all of us riders, solo sidecars, but sidecar passengers, I'd say in general, because you literally are just clinging on. And I was just, my arms just had nothing left in me and I literally just barreled off the back of the bike like my arms just let go. But from yeah, I, I learned from that. Afterwards though, is there was a massive problem with his levers. They, as he was tucked down in the bike, where the wind should just be going over the top of him. He had a cone at the top of his neck and the wind was just going in, the, down the back of his levers, and it was just dragging him and dragging him and dragging him. So it was actually a fault in the levers. And when he did come off and he did go skittling down the road, the levers just burst. They just burst open. They weren't stitched together properly. They were complete, like, they were completely rubbish. They were awful. 
So when he got back, obviously he still had all his stuff. Everything was like he just had a brand new RI helmet, like a thousand pound. Luckily, it didn't thank did not God, have a scratch on it. It, it was <laughs> it was fine. Like there was nothing wrong with it. But his leathers were literally in pieces. I was really, really, really lucky. So everyone that knows that the Summer Hundred course, it was down in towards Stadium Corner. It was probably the fastest point of the the circuit. I could have come out. And there's a bit of a there's a as you come out of Church Bend, so you go round through Great Meadows, I think it is, and there's a bit of a, on the sidecars, there's like a bit of a step. It must be where the road changes surfaces or whatever. On the run down to stadium, you can literally see the football club. And we're tucked right in there, but as it's gone over the step, it's like lifted my back up and the and the wind must have just pulled me a bit and I just had nothing to like pull me back in. So yeah, I, I come out there and I was in a, it was it's a straight line. Luckily, if it was, if that was through any sort of bends, I'd have been, I'd have been ran over without a doubt. But I, I slid towards the curb and I hit the curb with my with my right foot, I think it was, and then I sort of flip. I I bounced back the other way, and I was like, and I remember thinking I just need to get towards this wall because the next corner is a left hander, so everyone's on the right hand side of the road. So I I was like, I need to get over to this side, and I was laid down. And I was like, oh, well, now I'm on the wrong side of the road from the pavement. I need to get back over, and I could like the road was just rumbling underneath me and as like the bikes coming past. But yeah, I was I was very lucky. I mean, Darren Hope. Uh, another Manx sidecar crew and Lenny, they they said they literally, they they were a bit behind us. I think Mike Russell as well, and uh, I can't remember who he had on there, but they they sort of swerved out of the way of me after I'd come off it. And uh, Darren Hope said we we must have changed down to about fourth gear, and you were still rolling at the same speed we were going. I remember him saying that. So clear as day. So yeah, it was yeah that was a, a big eye opener as well, and I changed my whole outlook to race, and I proper had to ground myself a bit and realised I had to put a bit more effort in. I wasn't just this wonder kid that I thought I was. And But, yeah, and then that's why it was such a big thing doing TT as well because uh, there was... Uh, people were talking... I mean, I was only 18. Everyone was saying, oh, like, you're doing so well, blah, blah, blah. And I think after that, I, I sort of had something to prove then as well because people were thinking, oh, yeah, well, he got to his first road race and he and he come off, but then luckily I was all right. But I remember the the last lap of the first sidecar race. We we come round the Craig, and I was I, I burst into tears there. We still had we still had like to get back round, but I was, I was crying like the whole way down. I was like, oh, I can't believe I've done this. And then like you come in and you come up the return road, and I felt I felt so bad as well. And there was uh, everyone was like hanging over, like trying to give me like high fives and stuff, and I was just in bits. I like couldn't even move anymore. I was knackered, and I was like waving to people like, I'm sorry, I'm not getting up to give you a high five. But yeah, it's just. To, to go from that as well, that low with the, the Southern and coming off and stuff, and then thinking, because the Southern's just after the TT, I was thinking, right, I've got less than a year now, I've got to work my backside off, because that, that was the plan at Southern TT, and I was like, Jacko as well, like, bless his heart, he never doubted me at all, like, after that, like, I was like, I had my doubts in my head, you'll know that, I'm, I, I doubt myself yeah, all the time. Yeah, he was really bad for a, a few months, and everyone was just like what can we do to stop him from doubting himself he was like he was like tapping Jacko and when he taps Jacko Jacko knows it's either because he needs to stop or there's something wrong with the bike that's that's the only way we sort of communicate from or, what you're saying earlier you uh, just you just smack them on the back or yeah, on the leg or anything like or that or squeeze if someone's behind them and he was like tapping and Jacko wasn't stopping and he was coming back and he was going he's not stopping and Jacko was going this is the only way I can think of for him to get like get over it he was like he needs to get over it he was like i'm just gonna go and he was like and unless i think something's seriously wrong then i'll stop this is only on short circuits by the way yeah, yeah. no it wasn't at the roads we... and i he said to he said to me and he was like don't tell jake what i'm doing and i was like okay i won't and he was coming back he was going he's not stopping he's not stopping i've had enough of this and i'm going but you really need to stop and he's going what are you starting for as well and he's getting really grumpy and i'm just going jacko just carry on just keep going and it was fine and it worked. So whatever Jacko's <laughs> thought process was behind that, it worked. That intuition was just there. And I suppose, you know, mentally it was going to take you a long time yeah. to get back into it. We were, we, the Southern 100 was whenever it was last year. And then the, we had a Cadwell Park British Championship round two weeks later. About three weeks later. But three, three weeks later, I was, I was on crutches for a week. Um, I, that's my finger there from sliding down the road. That's that's like the bone now because I come I went down like that. It just burst my glove to bits. So, uh, yeah, I had a few scobs here and there, but my foot was the biggest problem. I'd actually torn the tendon that runs like along the top of your foot, so like the bit that does that. So, Isla Scott, the, the physio, she, she worked amazing. absolute wonders. I said to her, I went there and explained what happened, and I was like, I need to be riding in two weeks, and she was like, what? <laughs> and 
she was like hanging off my foot every which way, massaging it, and I must have gone there a couple of times. And we got to Cadwell, and uh, for people like when you're on the sidecar, the the tray that we sit on, effectively, when they break, obviously they're it's not like a bike; they break with their left foot, so the gears and are switched around, and they break with their left foot. Um, and because they're using their leg, obviously the braking force is dead hard. So we put our feet on the back of the platform as like an anchor, and it's that's just like embedded in me as well. Like and my foot was obviously still sore, and we were coming up the back straight at Cadwell. He was slamming on the brakes. I was putting my foot there, getting pain, and then like it was it was just crazy. And and every time I got arm pump as well, I was smacking him on the back. I was like, oh no, I'm gonna come off. I'm gonna come off. So yeah, it's I think that's a struggle as well. If I was riding a solo bike, I'd have just rode round doing horrendous for a while but when you've got someone else to like push her as well I think that's the only reason I came back better than I did as well you've got that again we go back to that sort of like feeling of responsibility for someone yeah. else yeah definitely oh I feel exhausted just <laughs> a little bit neck. so uh it is the long winter ahead I don't want to remind you of that but you know um just start planning the the birthday party now <laughs> what's the aim going forward um so this year we we took a sort of step back from the the short circuits because Mike's just started his own business freight hobby he brings freight to and from so he's running his own business between here and the UK and he sort of doesn't know where he's going to be today or tomorrow because he's just going where the work is so we we do normally have done the whole British Championship we didn't this year we we sort of did the first couple of rounds because between people don't realize as well between March and TT at the end of May there's not many meetings so you've got to sort of go where the meetings are to get yourself bike fit as we call it you can do all the preparations you want but riding the bike's what you need so we did all of that and then did tt and we we sort of haven't really done much since i've i've sort of been riding with different people just to keep my keep in the loop i guess but i think next year we'll, we'll, we'll have to go back to the drawing board and see what see what the plan is but definitely tt probably but depending on jacko's situation i might go and do bits with other people in short circuits or what but yeah to it's a lot to just jump on and do TT with someone else. So we've we've been riding together a couple of years now. So that's that's probably the, the route we'll go down. Yeah, I can imagine it would be a really hard decision because, again, you're building up that relationship so quickly it doesn't happen probably with many people. No, no, it doesn't. And driving sidecars, it's like driving... Like everyone drives their car different, don't they? And everyone drives their sidecar different. And people like different things. People want passengers to do different things. So you've got to, like... It is just all about the teamwork, like... And other drivers as well, they won't sort of tell you what they want. You've just got to, you've got to, we're people pleasers as passengers. You've got to keep the bike happy and the driver happy because at the end of the day, you're not there riding it. You're just, you're just there for the ride, aren't you? But we'll just see what happens. Obviously, we, we've got some great people yeah. in the sidecar community over here in the Isle of Man. Is there one person that you think, that's who I want to be like? Um, I don't know, it's a hard one that is because there's, there's so many good people and there's so many people that to, to like give you help, but... I mean, Patrick Farrance for one, he's he's that's probably it. he's helped me loads. I mean, on the on the run up to TT, I was bloody bombarding him on Facebook with messages like he's one on a DMR chassis. That's what we ride a Dave Molyneux bike, and he's rode with Molly and rides LCRs, and he's world champion this that, and the other. But so yeah, probably probably Patrick. Yeah, he 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 took the time as well to help me loads. As I say, everyone knows everyone, so he's known me since I was however old and. Yeah, just to take the time. He comes over to do all sorts of press and stuff for the TT, but to take the time to come and speak to me and stuff as well. And come driving yeah. around the TT course, like yeah, giving we were, him pointers. First, not the first. It was Monday, wasn't it? The mm-hmm. first practice. Patrick was ringing me at six o'clock in the morning. He was like, "I'm at the start of pit lane," and I was like, "Oh!" <laughs> Ran up there as fast as I could and going around just to get some last minute tips and tricks. But yeah, d- yeah, Patrick, without a doubt. I have to ask you what he's like as a passenger in the car. <laughs> he's a nightmare. Considering he passed his driving test after me, and I used to drive him everywhere, since he's passed his driving test and he's, like, big into his side cars, he's a nightmare. I can't drive anywhere. He was like, I'm driving, I'm driving, I'm driving. Get out, let me drive. I must say, though, Abby must know, like, what I do around this course as well as I do. We'll, like, f- we'll be driving around the course and you'll be like, yeah, so where'd you get out here? What'd you do here? What'd you do there? And I just, like, splur it back to him. It's just an bedded in my brain but there's definitely no hint of you ever wanting to do the same no never they actually do taxi rides at cadwell park so you can you can just rock up and you can have a go on a sidecar and i've, I've said to you a couple of times do you want to do it do you want to do it and she's like absolutely no chance he keeps trying to convince me maybe with jacko next year <laughs> oh okay do you reckon you'd fancy it me yeah no i'll sit on a 
tray in the kitchen <laughs> and just get someone to pour me round on that. It's nearly the same thing. Jake, where can people keep up to date with the, what you're doing and how you're getting on? Um, so we've we've got an Instagram page that I that I sort of run. That's it's MJR Sidecar. That is that's it's we haven't really touched that for a bit because we've been a bit quiet, but. Um, I think Jacko's got a, a racing page on, on Facebook as well, but myself on Facebook as well. That's sort of all I use Facebook for is for racing and stuff like that. But other than that, I come and find us in the paddock or whatever, yeah. whenever, wherever we're racing, yeah. I normally put updates on my Facebook as well, so on there as well. <laughs> they're normally public as well, so if they're not friends with me, they can probably still see them. <laughs> well, Jake, Abby, brilliant to talk to both of you. Abby, good luck for the winter with it. <laughs> thank you. I can imagine <laughs> it won't be easy and uh, we can't wait to see what you do next year. Oh, thank you. This Journey to a Dream podcast has been brought to you by Kawasaki Insurance. Visit their website, kawasaki-insurance.co.uk, to find out how you can get covered.